Hello um, and welcome. Um, I'm Tracy Hamston from More Meadows and this is the last of our talks for this winter. Um, we're delighted to have three expert speakers with us tonight talking about a range of subjects all to do with hedges. Um, it's a really huge subject and we've only got an hour and a half. However, we are planning plenty of time for questions at the end. So can I ask you to please paste your questions in the chat window on YouTube and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. Um, I can see we've got quite a few people pasting where they're from. So we've got all sorts of people coming in from different parts of the country, which is great. Um, I've just add if you're watching on the Eventbrite window, if you click the YouTube icon, that will take you through into YouTube where you can actually use the chat window. So for those of you um, that aren't familiar with More Meadows, um, I'll just say a few words about who we are and what we do. It's a Dartmoor-based community group of around 800 landowners, farmers and gardeners who are restoring and creating flower-rich grasslands on all scales from meadows to um, even shed roofs and acres of hay meadows. So we've also got an online communication platform for people all over Devon and beyond, the Meadow Makers Forum. Um, and that's where people interested in meadows can communicate with each other and share information. And I'll stick a link in the chat window towards the end of the evening so you can go and have a look and do join, um, do join the group if you'd like to. So I'm gonna, start up with um rob walton um so rob um if you're if you're familiar with hedge talks you've probably come across rob before um he's been closely involved with hedges for over 30 years uh, he formerly worked for natural england and its predecessors um, as part of um, as a hedgerow specialist and he now works as an ecological consultant, but he also helps to manage the family farm in Devon, and that has many miles of hedges. He's the chair of the Devon Hedge Group and has been closely involved with Hedgelink, the national body which brings organisations and individuals interested in hedgerows together. And he's been involved with that for many years. So um, good evening, Rob. I'll just bring you into the studio. Good evening. Um, I'm actually going to operate Rob's slides tonight because I think your broadband's not so great, is it? So um... that's right. That's right. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me, Tracy? I can hear Tra you loud and clear. Yes, you're all good to go. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Yes, I do apologise, but my broadband here on our rather isolated farm in the middle of Devon isn't that great, which is why Tracy is changing the slides for me. Um, I, I'm delighted, as always, to be talking about hedges because they are truly remarkable things. And here in the UK, in England, we've got, you know, amongst the best hedges in the world. And I like to think that the hedges we have here in Devon are indeed the very best hedges in the world. Um, in a UK context, one in every 10 hedges in the country is in Devon, and one in five of all the hedges that are species rich, that, you know, in terms of the numbers of sh different shrubs and species they have. And also, of course, in Devon, our hedges have these mighty great banks underneath them. So they're very special for that reason too. Now, our hedges are wonderful for wildlife, but they're also very, very useful for us humans too. And so that's what my talk is about. It's about the, the, their wildlife value and about the value to us. So if I could start by having um, the first slide, please, Tracy. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm going to start with biodiversity. Um, there's really good research which shows that in intensive farmland areas, and let's face it, you know, most of lowland England is intensive farmland. Even here in Devon, you know, we've got our wonderful patchworks of green fields, but most of those green fields are intensive grassland and they're effectively wildlife deserts. 
And in landscapes like that, which are so prevalent across England, the only place really where the wildlife get a chance of surviving is in the hedges. And just to back that up, a study that was done in Somerset on an, an organic farm in Somerset showed that even though the hedges took up just 5% of the area of the farm, something like 95% of all the species found on that farm were found in those hedges. So their value far exceeds um, the area of which they occupy. It's completely disproportionate. Next slide, please. Now, on a car journey with a friend, um, I was challenged to see, to try and find out how many different species of animal and plant and fungi can occur in a single hedge, because nobody really knew. And so on New Year's Day, um, 2011, I started to count. And I continued until the last day of 2012. And during that, those two years, um, and with a lot of help from experts, I was able to find no less than 2,070 different species within this single hedge. It's a hedge on our farm here in the middle of Devon, and it's not a special he hedge in a Devon context. There are thousands of hedges like it. It's not a remarkable hedge, but yet it's got that simply awe-inspiring number of species in it. We, because we're so large and we tend to move so quickly, we don't tend to see all this wildlife within the hedges, but it's there. Now, the contraption, the tent-like thing you see in the image there is a malaise trap named after René Malaise, a Swedish entomologist, and it's phenomenally effective at finding uh, insects, particularly flying insects like flies. Indeed, I, I'm very keen on flies. I really made a real focus on those, and I found 830 different species of fly in this one hedge, and there are more there as well. Um, I, I would just hasten to say at this stage that, to me, a hedge is not just a line of trees and shrubs. It's more than that. A good hedge will also have a flower-rich margin or tussocky grass margin, preferably both. And if you're in Devon, of course, you have a bank. You can't see it in this photograph because the leaves are obscuring it. But you also have a ditch as well. And all those components, you know, the, the trees, the shrubs, the margins, the ditch, the bank, all together make up the hedge and make up the wonderful wildlife habitat that we see. 2,000 species, well, that sounds a lot. It is a lot. But in fact, it's an underestimate. I reckon that if everything I found could be identified, it would be more like 3,000 species. Enormous diversity. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm just going to run you through now a few of the species, the special species, which occur in Devon and which are heavily dependent upon hedges. The first of these is this beautiful butterfly, the brown hair streak, a very elusive species. Not many people see it, um, but what it does is it lays its eggs only on the new growth of blackthorn. And one reason why this butterfly has declined so much across most of the country is because of the practice of hard annual cutting with a flail of hedges. That destroys most of the eggs. I'm sure that Nigel will talk a lot more about hedge cutting and flailing in his talk. I'm in no means against it. We flail quite a lot of our hedges on this farm, but it has to be done the right way. Next slide. Thank you. And then probably our most iconic bird in Devon is the sole bunting. Um, undergone, was very rare, undergone a great recovery thanks to the effort of the RSPB and Natural England and others. And But it's, it's dependent upon hedges for at least some of its resources. It breeds in hedges and it also uses the trees as songposts. Next species. Sorry, next slide. Um, and here we have a hedgehog. Well, I don't really need to say much more about hedgehogs. Um, they're obviously reliant on hedges, the name says it. One does wonder that if there weren't any hedges, what they would be called, presumably just hogs. Uh, next slide. 
And um, bats, yeah, all our British bats use hedges um, to one, some extent or another. This is the great horseshoe bat, a, a species for which Devon is, is rightly famed. Uh, radio tracking shows that these bats and others, they closely follow hedges when they're moving through the landscape. The hedges are their, their roads, their, um, the things they follow. So much so that for this particular bat, when the hedges are removed, they have such a, a mental map of the landscape, they continue to follow those precise lines for quite some while. But they're also, of course, foraging down the hedges and finding the larger uh, moths and beetles and crane flies and the like upon which they feed. Next slide. And my particular favourite here um, is the hazel dormouse. We, we tend to think of the hazel dormouse as being a species of woodland, but really it's not. It's a species of woodland edge or scrub, and that's exactly what a hedge is, isn't it? It's a line of scrub or, or it's a woodland edge. And dormice do very well in our hedges here in Devon. We've got some strong populations and they're just as strong as the very best woodlands for dormice. We're extraordinarily fortunate to have these beautiful creatures here. Next slide. But that's just a run through of very few of the species that occur in our, our hedges that are special. I just couldn't leave this discussion about the wildlife without thinking a little bit about the wonderful spring flowers that will be gracing our hedge banks in a few months, um, particularly like the image on the left hand side, which is you know very patriotic, red, white and blue of the campion, the stitchwort and the bluebell. Uh, but just again, come back to flailing. If these hedges weren't trimmed regularly and quite hard, then you wouldn't get these displays of flowers. But I'll leave that to Nigel. Ne next, please. Uh, hedgerow trees, hugely important. Research on moths shows that they use them to as uh, stepping stones when they're moving, dispersing through the countryside. They also seem to be act as sort of lighthouses, beacons, if you like, with lots of insects collecting around their tops. And of course, where the insects collect, so you get the birds and the bats that feed upon them. And then many trees, they don't actually flower and fruit very well under the dense canopy of a woodland. But when they're released from that in our hedgerows, they can be prolific in that respect. Next slide. Thank you. Moving on a little bit to how hedges are useful, not just to wildlife, to, but to us too. Uh, lots of evidence that if you want healthy pollinator populations in farmland, then you probably have to have the hedges because they offer all sorts of resources. In terms of crop pollination, then they can actually be effective at increasing the amount of seed or the amount of fruit for up to 750 meters away from the hedge. That's based largely on bumblebees. Next slide. And here we have, you know, in, in a Devon context, it's orchards we should be talking about, I think, for pollinators. And here we have in this slide, we have Monsieur Le Jean in Normandy speaking to a group of us, including Nigel. And he was waxing lyrical about the value of hedges um, for his orchard. And instantly he produced very good Calvados. But he, he said, you know, when the bumblebees and the solitary bees, when they're not pollinating his apple trees, where are they getting their nectar and their pollen? Well, of course, from the hedgerows. Where are they breeding in the hedgerows? Where are they hibernating in the hedgerows? So the hedgerows and the orchard trees go absolutely hand in hand from his point of view. Next slide. Pest control, reams of research done on this, that basically hedges are the places where these predators spend their winter, their populations, they build up their populations there in the spring, and then they spread out into the fields. So things like 
carabid beetles, ladybird beetles, hoverflies, spiders. They spread out into the field and there they find the aphids and other crop, pest, crop pests, effective over distances of at least 60 meters out from the hedge, and of course, reduce the need for pesticides. Next slide. Shelter and shade, something particularly important, I think, with, uh, as our climate is changing. We're all aware of how important hedges are for uh, lambs in the spring. Perhaps less well known is just how important they are for cattle in the summer. Cattle are very prone to heat stress. When they get stress like that, they grow slower, they produce less milk, and they're far more susceptible to diseases like mastitis. I think farmers are going to increasingly appreciate hedgerow trees in the future as we get more and more heat waves. They're also important hedges as windbreaks. I mean, that's what a windbreak is, isn't it? A tall hedge. And they can be, you know, really increase yields in that respect of uh, arable and horticultural crops, particularly vegetables. 75% increases in yields have been noted because you can reduce the wind speed by using tall hedges. Thank you. Next slide. And then uh, a very topical matter, flooding. Hedges are what's called one of these natural solutions to the flood problem. Here we see up above Braunton in North Devon, um, banks yet to be planted with trees being placed along the contours above a stream that runs down into the town. The town is prone to winter flooding and the Environment Agency have granted the construction of these banks. I would hasten to add the purpose of them is not to serve as dams. The surface is the purpose is that they slow down the rate at which waters following a storm actually reach the watercourses and so reduce the risk of flood downstream. Next slide. And likewise, hedges on contours can be very effective at conserving soil. I think this is a quite extraordinary slide. It shows when a bit of netting is put down slope from, I think this is a maize crop, after just one storm event, how much soil that piece of netting has saved. Now hedges, whether they're banked or not, do exactly the same thing. And extraordinarily important at soil conservation. If you look at any contouring hedge that's been there in some distance of time, you'll find that the soil is built up behind the hedge and formed a terrace. And indeed, over the centuries, over the millennia, hedges transform landscapes in this way. Next slide. Also, they clean our water. In the right place, hedges can remove nearly all the artificial fertilizers, you know, nitrogen and phosphates from water. They also can remove large quantities of pesticides. So keeping our waterways cleaner and better for wildlife and whatever else we're going to use them for. Next slide. Cleaner air too, particularly in our urban areas. Hedges can form really effective barriers between vehicles and pedestrians. I mean, here the hedge is in the wrong place. It should really be situated um, between the pavement and the road. And in circumstances like that, they can be really effective at capturing nasty pollutants like particulates and nitrogen oxides and preventing them from reaching our lungs. Um, evergreen hedges are best from that point of view, but failing that you want to use trees and shrubs with hairy and rough leaves because they capture these pollutants. Next slide. Also all the rage these days is really about carbon storage and capture for obvious climate uh, mitigation reasons. Um, it's pretty clear that hedges are going to contain more carbon than do open fields. But just to remind you that carbon is stored not just in the woody bits above ground, but also in the roots below ground. 
and in particular as soil organic com carbon now it's if it's locked up in the soil it's likely to be there for a long time whereas the above ground biomass gets recycled as the trees are felled or die um, carbon can continue to accumulate underground in the soil for centuries next slide how much well working in Brittany where there are very similar hedge landscapes to here in the west country something like between 13 and 38 percent of all the soil organic carbon in those landscapes is locked up in hedges so they can have an appreciate they are an appreciable carbon store next slide and it's in recognition of that that the climate change committee in their uh, net zero report published in what was it 2020 um, recommended that there should be a 40 percent increase in hedge extent um, by 2050 to meet our net zero targets now they're keen on that and farmers are keen on it as well because it's an easy win it's easy to let your hedge grow a bit wider it's relatively easy to plant a new hedge much easier often than many of the other management things that have to be undertaken to reduce carbon on your farm or store carbon on your farm next slide and in the same vein of course just as they um, store carbon in the biomass that's good for climate change too too it's good if you're managing your hedge as a wood fuel crop and there's lots of work being done now across the channel but also in this country to show that for on-farm usage managing your hedges to produce a wood fuel crop then can be a very cheap very efficient way of providing heat energy at the same time you can improve the health of your hedge but above all it provides value to your hedge which is often so lacking for farmers i know i've said that they're valuable for pollination and for pest control or soil conservation of course they are but in terms of immediate accounting the value of wood fuel is that you can say immediately i have saved this much money on my fuel bill to heat my farmhouse or my poultry sheds or whatever else it may be they have real potential which we must exploit in that regard next slide um, switching tack a little bit here you know what would devon look like what would england look like most of it lowland england if it didn't have hedges well to my mind pretty stark and barren and uninteresting when you look at landscape character assessments they all nearly always stress the value of hedges because that's what def they define the field patterns and in turn you will see many a farm produce being marketed on the back of good well hedged landscapes when you come to sell your farm they add value as well in that way next slide and I mean, this could be a whole talk on its own, of course, but enormous cultural and historic value. Um, in Devon, for example, over two thirds of our hedges are ancient. They're 600 years or more old. They're medieval in origin. Um, you know, people tend to think that all our hedges were created by the Enclosure Acts, which are 1750 to 1850. That really isn't true over the great majority of this country. And because they define head field patterns, they reveal an awful lot about landscape history. You can read the history of the landscape from its hedgerows. And, and I know Nigel's going to talk about this, so I shan't dwell on it, but we all have our traditional hedge lane si styles as well. It's part of our culture. And this here is shown is the Devon style. Next slide. And I, this is just about my last slide. Um, but just to say, you know, the one thing the pandemic has brought home to us is how important it is for our well-being to be able to get out into nature, even if it's in a town or city, walking alongside a hedge, 
can do us good. And even better, if we can get out and join a party like this at an event, actually carrying out hedgerow management. It's good physical activity, gets you fit, and of course, there's good social interaction. So my final slide, please. So just to summarize, um, hedges do actually bring us many different benefits. Uh, they're, they're vital for our wildlife. They're very important for farm productivity. Uh, conserve our soils, help to keep you know, floods away from our land and our buildings. They clean our air and our water. They reduce the rate of climate change by storing, capturing and storing carbon and they create these healthy, beautiful landscapes. So thank you very much for listening. If I just have one final slide. Um, just to remind you, if I, if I need to do so, that Devon, and sorry to be so parochial about this, but Devon really does have the very best hedges in the world. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Back to you, Tracy. Thanks very much, Rob. That was really interesting. And I'm so impressed by your two years of counting all those species, even though you did have some help with that. Um, I'm going to move on to Nigel now. Um, so we've heard all about the amazing kind of wildlife and all the other benefits of hedges. So Nigel is going to tell us a lot more um, about the management side of it, um, which is another huge subject. Um, so yeah, welcome, Nigel. And I shall just unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, Nigel? Mute myself? How's that? Thank you. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> Everybody should know that by now, shouldn't they really? So thank you very much and thank you for Rob for that fascinating talk. So I'm going to be talking about hedge management today. Um, and I think that management of our hedges is of the paramount importance, really, because all the um, services that Rob talked about, really healthy hedges, um, produce those services. We don't have healthy hedges, then we're not going to get what we need from hedges on from biodiversity to wood fuel to everything so healthy hedges is the way to go i'm going to go to share my screen tracy have you got it there or do i i shall share my screen myself see what that brings yeah, yeah. just pop your powerpoint up and i think we're ready to go good good we can't see it at the moment. That's it. Right. And um, spending most of my days at the moment this winter laying hedges um, and uh, writing hedgerow management plans, etc. So hedgerows, um, Rob's alluded to already, we both agree they are vital to our countryside. You can't imagine the British countryside without hedges. They give us so much. Uh, the last countryside survey used to be, the countryside survey used to be done every 10 years. The last one was in 2007, and it showed throughout the country that on average, about 50% of hedges were in favorable condition when set against a, a criteria to judge that, 50%. A sad state of affairs, really, is that in uh, arable areas, managed hedgerows, only 12% of hedgerows were in favourable condition. So something's going wrong there, I think. Um, uh, and I think it is the management. So let's just talk quickly about two types of hedgerows. I think we have two main types of hedgerows. This is what you might find in Devon, your species rich hedgerows. Um, you know, um, often what used to be woodland edges. And I think the concept of a woodland edge, as Rob said, is a very important factor. If we think about hedgerows as woodland edges, and if we think how much, how dynamic a woodland edge is, then we're halfway to understanding hedgerows. Hedgerows are a very dynamic hedgerow, uh, very dynamic habitat. We want them to be full of those shrubs that we would find on a woodland edge, from the hawthorns to the blackthorns to the spindles, everything all those shrubby species are woodland edge species and we in effect have a whole series of linear 
woodland edges which are constantly trying to change so there's the ancient species rich small field higgledy piggledy hedges and then we have in um the other half of the country really not just in central england that goes up right up into yorkshire and down wiltshire and southeast etc are the enclosure hedges the previously open field systems that were then enclosed and usually enclosed with pure hawthorn hedges and by design very straight lines etc i think these are causing us the most problems uh in our modern world but we will work up to that I'm going to sort of build up my slideshow to uh, introduce this concept of a hedgerow management cycle. Um, it is the fact that I believe that hedgerows have to be rejuvenated periodically, and it is our job through management, the correct management, to slow down the period of time between those interventions as long as possible, but ultimately realizing that we do have to rejuvenate a hedge. So why do we manage hedges? Well, if, I suppose if we didn't, manage hedges, these things that we've planted or have occurred naturally, um, something like this would occur. It's a neglected hedge. It's got way out of control. It is past being good enough to lay. If we cut it to ground level, it may or may not respond. It might be getting too old and, and into old age for it to produce new shoots. It's got away from us. It's neglected. And an awful lot of hedges in the countryside are completely neglected. They have not been managed. This is a hedge near me here in the Chiltern Hills. It's a, a clearly a hawthorn enclosure hedge, but it has not been managed now at all. I, in fact, I can't see any sign of it ever being laid, but it's now absolutely collapsing. It's 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 at the end of the natural life of a hawthorn, really. It's you know coming up to, I don't know, 160 years old or whatever it is. It's absolutely collapsing. It's been neglected. And one stage further on from neglecting is that trees may well start to invade a hedge and very soon the tree the hedgerow might become a line of trees nothing wrong with a line of trees um, you know insects bats etc hunt along these woodland edges but they do become lines of trees and no longer are recorded to as hedges and possibly don't provide ultimately that shrubby kind of uh, habitat that we want so much this is um, a line of oak trees but with a hedge hanging on underneath underneath there and ultimately very often th th those shrubby species can't uh, survive that lack of light so neglect the neglect of a hedge sends it into old age it sends it overgrown it lowers amount of options available to us in terms of management so how did we over historically stop hedges being neglected we for for one thing we we trimmed our hedges and hedges were always trimmed by hand often following laying which we'll talk about in a while but uh, the hedges were trimmed by hand. Nothing was wasted. All that um, brash that they're cutting off would have uh, been used uh, to make faggots, to light uh, bread ovens, etc. They put the thorn underneath hay and straw ricks to stop the mice and rats getting under there. They even put the clippings in the bottom of ditches as a sort of sediment trap, as it were. So hedgerows were managed quite often by trimming. And then come sort of 1930s, 40s, there were all sorts of... Uh, Crazy inventions, great British engineering, I suppose, they invented things like this thing, health and safety nightmare, I would have thought, with a reciprocating knife blade, but all developed to trim the hedge and control it. And I think that's an interesting word, control. We, Once we'd invented these machines, we perhaps thought that, well, we don't need to bother with rejuvenating our hedges or laying our hedges anymore. We're just going to trim them. They're, they're sorted, you know. And now we're at a stage, if... This is the flail machine, of course, which probably came about in what? I don't know, the late 60s, early 70s, something like that. Um, and ever since, a lot of hedges have been cut at the very same height now for what is getting on 50, 60, sometimes even, I guess, in 70 years. They've been cut at the same height. And it is that pressure of cutting at the same height, which I'm going to dwell on here in a minute, which is sending a lot of hedges the in the opposite direction uh, than neglect it's sending them down the slide of over management so that's the the flail machine in devon i believe you have a, a another way of trimming your hedges uh, i put that in there to see if you're all still awake that's uh, in ireland i think anyway hedgerows uh, hedge trimming there's nothing wrong with the hedge machine trimming machine if it's done correctly it can make a really really good job uh, my father for example when we were small driving around he was a farmer he used to say to us as kids on holiday um they must be really good farmers around here look at their hedges they're really neat and tidy and there's a certain truth in that a certain pride in it 
Uh, but we know now, I think, better that we, we do want some of our hedges to be a bit more wild and woolly and not trimmed. But this this hedge is a, is a, is a lovely trimmed hedge. Um, don't let anybody ever tell you that uh, hawthorn doesn't trim. It certainly does. Um, but it won't last forever in that in that um, under that regime. But this is the sad truth about a lot of our specifically, I dare I say, arable areas of the country. These hedges have been trimmed. This is a hawthorn hedge trimmed at the same height since who knows when, the 1950s, I don't know. There's to the right of the screen there, there are some signs of early laying. But the stems are going through their aging process. The height remains the same. The, the sort of brush in the lower dense part of the hedges is being sent upwards. It wants to become a mature hawthorn tree, a tall hawthorn tree, where you never get low branches on a mature single hawthorn tree, do you? So, but this is the state of a lot of our, of a lot of our hedgerows around the country. This one, we can even see that it's been laid. So we know that way back in time, that, that hedge there had lots and lots of stems, enough so that it was laid to make a thick, dense, stock-proof barrier. Now that's only one pleacher left there. And elderberry is invading this hedge. The typical thing that happens to lowland uh, hedges, the elderberry gets in, it almost thrives on this harsh trimming regime and pretty well sort of starts to kill, kill everything around it. But that hedge is literally, you know, no longer. There's not enough stems along it to give us any options of management. Here's an absolutely shocking one. This was in uh, Northamptonshire, I think. It even looks like they've sprayed the base of that hedgerow. Couldn't do anything with that, even if we let it grow up. The, head, the stems are gnarled and rotten, as you can see. No chance of laying that, even if we did let it grow up. So it, it's a sort of gone. You've got to coppice that to ground level and plant up the gaps, really. So I've got quite a few of these. The equivalent hedge, I might sort of say that, you know, that the, the mixed species hedges of Devon are very different than the Hawthorne hedges, it's true to say, but this might be heading the same way. Uh, this is down in the West Country. You know, it's being trimmed down to about a foot from the bank height there. And that hazel on top there is just becoming a line of sticks and will inevitably, through over trimming, um, fade away as well. This one almost requires no words. I couldn't believe that one uh, when I hopped over the fence. <laughs> stopped on the road and hopped over the fence and took a picture of it it's being thrashed on top the sheep are getting underneath it either side um there's no hope for that hedge whatsoever uh, apart from a nice pretty picture in the lake district this hedge is a sycamore tree actually in a hedge line either side of that but you can see how that sort of candelabra effect is being formed by the hedge being trimmed at exactly the same height why are these hedges trimmed at the same height? Why do we presume that a hedge has to be this kind of four foot or so height? It's an interesting one. And I think I've come up with about four reasons, really. One is that it roughly represents the height of a finished laid hedge, certainly in, you know, in the Midlands, that, that is. Uh, so we have this concept that a hedge is already about four foot tall. Um, they trimmed it by hand, so you couldn't really reach much taller than that height. Um, the, the, the hunting fraternity liked to jump them in you know midlands etc farmers like to see over the top of them perhaps often to see what their livestock are doing in the field and finally i think the modern flail head the, the actual cutting head has developed to be about that height so that one can have one pass either side and then one on top so we're sort of stuck with this idea that that's the height that you trim a hedge and this is in effect an idea i had to, to put over what's happening here if we if we planted a hedge and we put it in one of these steel gabion boxes, these things that you put stones in, you know, the side of motorways, etc. Then at first, that newly planted hedge is probably going to do all right. We, we, we keep trimming it off. Anything pops out the side of the box there or at the top, we'll trim that off. And it'll be full. It'll be full of green, you know, after 15, 20 years. And then it will you know, remain green for a while. But after a long time, those stems will start to get thicker and thicker inside. They'll become gnarled and twisted they're all competing for light the green growth the small branches go to the top of that box and that's what we're in that's effectively what we're doing when we cut a hedge at the same height all the time just like this hedge this has self-thinned itself you know stems in between all those have just disappeared they've given up and uh, slowly but surely that hedge is imperceptibly fading away no one's digging it out but it's imperceptibly fading away and this is the sort of damage that occurs if you cut at that same height. The plant wants to go up. And so you're, the trimmer of this hedge has said, no, I, I don't want it to go at all above a certain height. So I'm going to now be cutting thick wood. And what typically happens is you get this, what I call a knuckle forming at the cut line. 
uh, it's a kind of contorted growth. It's like a reaction to the stress that plant is under. And that is a sure sign if you're managing a hedge and you're trimming them, you start to see that knuckle and it's the, it's the hedge kindly asking you to really relax the trimming and start to incrementally allow that hedge to develop in size and width. And this might be a hedge which we could look at and say, well, it's got lots of stems, therefore we have options. I could, if I was so inclined, coppice that and I, I know I would have lots of stems going to sprout new growth, but I could also let that grow up to lay again. Or I could incrementally trim that hedge and allow it to slowly grow up over the next 15, even 20 years, just, you know, a few inches at a time. Every time I trim it, just allow it to, 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 to go on up. We call that incremental trimming. And you can often get a hedge back from the, the, the cliff of, you know, destruction through over trimming. You can get them back quite, quite quickly by just incrementally backing off letting the hedge actually breathe and having enough small leaves to kind of support itself, really. And um, Hedgelink uh, um, set out on a research project some years ago now, which I was involved in. It was over six or seven years, and we found five farms throughout the country, including Devon, with uniform sort of hedges. We gave them a harsh cut back, the whole length of all the hedges, a harsh cut back to a sort of baseline marked it into 25 meter sections and then carried out different management on each of those 25 meters. So we would cut really hard down annually on some sections, other sections we would cut every two years, every three years, um, lots of different um, prescriptions for different sections. And I introduced this concept of incremental trimming. I said, please, can we look at sections where we just back off slightly, even if we're cutting it yearly, every two years or three years, when we go back to cut it, let's not cut it back to that same height. Because although we know we're going to get berries after two or three years, we're just smashing the hedge back down to that same level. We're not helping the health of the hedge. It's important to look at the health of the hedge, not just the fact that you're getting berries one in every three years sort of thing. So this was one of the sections you're looking at there. That's after about four or five years, that guy's just trimming um, as requested, giving it a light trim. Uh, I always think that the sound of a hedge trimmer when it's trimming, if I make a, might make a terrible uh, um, imitation of a machine working. When you hear a machine that's working badly, it is literally going to sound like. <coughs> if you hear a machine that's working nicely, it's literally like a <coughs> as it goes along. And you see the hedge finish is these little white flecks. That's the ideal trimming regime to me because it tells you immediately you are being incremental. You are moving out. Um, so incremental trimming really did work well and i'll show you some results in a minute this is a hedge which has been incrementally trimmed you'll see what i mean there the flecks of white that are on it this is a hawthorn hedge trimmed magnificently trims just as well as anything else in fact hawthorn trims a lot better than things like maple spindle wayfaring tree all these things that do actually shatter um, for a period in time in its life cycle hawthorn trims perfectly perfectly well and that has been incrementally allowed to annually be trimmed, but but just coming back off it ever so slightly each year. It's interesting how we often are, in effect, imitating nature. This hedge uh, hasn't been trimmed with a machine, but it's been trimmed, if you like, by cattle grazing. This is a dairy farm and the guy puts up an electric fence along this hedge and you can see automatically they're getting that sort of A-shaped uh, hedge as the cow reaches forward. OK, it's not getting to the top there. That needs to be trimmed soon. But that is, in effect, herbivores grazing the side of a hedge and, and if, you know that is what we are doing with the machine we're, we're almost imitating the grazing of, by large herbivores of of hedge foliage and uh, you know you'll find on there that you'll get berries every year because it's not being trimmed back hard you don't get berries growing on hedgerows that are trimmed every single year it, 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 harshly you need two or three year growth for the blossom to form on and the berries to form on and uh, after time, with incremental trimming, you can get marvellous looking hedges like this, uh, blackthorn hedge with just absolutely full of blossom and hopefully full of fruit the, the following um, autumn. And it's these berries, you know, uh, that, that we want to um, to for our overwintering birds, etc., to feed on and, and things like dormice to, to gorge on in the autumn to build up reserves it's the blossom and the berries the blossom is particularly important because at different times of the year things blossom starting with the wild plum to blackthorn and hawthorn 
on it goes different blossoms at different times of the year especially the early spring when the when the insects are uh, emerging and they want to to get that to next to source um it's vital to have lots of different species which as i say you know millions of field fairs and red wings flock down to our country specifically more often than not to feed on the hawthorn berries which provide this lush uh, food source so this is um won't dwell on this too long but very simple results of our trimming experimenting so i want you to look please on the left hand side standard cutting intensity the hollow white uh, boxes are autumn cutting that is typically when people cut after the harvest soon after september the first as soon as they can get in they're cutting um, the hedges and the hatch blocks there are late winter so people about now for example in the final weeks of the season um, are going in and trimming the hedges and this was counting the berries that were left uh, as it were after the cut so down in the bottom left hand corner you see a very low percentage of weight of uh, berries coming off the hedges that are trimmed in early september october they are smashing off all the berries that would be available uh, throughout for later on in the winter the hatch box next to that one there is uh, showing you what is remaining after uh, for the winter on an annually trimmed hedge that is not being cut in September, but rather left on there until um, the February. So the second year cut there shows a slightly larger amount of berries there uh, because some fruit does form on two year wood, but the, most of that is being cut off in September, won't be available uh, throughout the winter. And the hatch box next to there is showing a much larger amount of fruit that is left on there albeit cut every two years, it's been cut in late winter in February. And the same for the three year, it's a large amount of berries again. And then the uncut control showing a constant amount of berries every single year. But on the right hand side, you'll see this incremental cutting intensity. Same principle, the white blocks are cut in late September. So that is what is left after the cut. And far greater, more than double uh, the amount of berries are still remained on there because you're not smashing back to everything, you're just moving out slightly. And even in, uh, through to the end of February that's what is left and on it goes the second year is greater all those figures all those numbers show a greater amount of berries every year rather than the the previous ones you know every year rather than every two years if you're on a cutting regime or every you know second or third year if you're on a three-year cutting regime so incremental trimming to me not only gives health back to the hedge um, but it um, provides a certain amount of berries every single year and it's good for the health of the hedge. The health of the hedge to me has to be paramount completely. So this is a hedge which hasn't been touched for quite some years. The farmer's not had the expense of cutting his hedge. It can be thousands of pounds to trim hedges on large farms. Uh, he's walked away from that. Um, and of course, if we did go in with a flail, we would have that effect again, or even worse, in fact. And whilst I can't tell you that that's going to kill the hedge, it certainly, you know, it, it, it's, it's not very pretty for a start and it must surely be stressing the plant itself one good alternative to that is a circular saw blade so you could leave a hedge uncut for eight or ten years think of the money you would save and then go back in and reshape that hedge all that stuff falls off the hedge there it's like a hot knife through butter it falls off and is quite easy to push up and burn or chip or whatever you want to do to it now that's not rejuvenation that's not taking it down to the ground but it's certainly a way of buying time if you do that every ten years a couple of three times uh, before you intervene at the base, this circular saw blade does a far better job, far smoother cuts. So as this, um, we've looked at neglect and we've looked at over trimming, two extreme ends of a life cycle. But somewhere in the middle of the life cycle is a hedge like this, which has been allowed to grow up. This is one of your West Country hedges and it's ready, perfect for rejuvenation. It's got lots and lots of stems, um, as it does this hedge. Lots of stems gives us option. We could either coppice it and use the wood fuel or we could indeed lay the hedge. And a quick uh, look at all these regional styles. Rob mentioned many regional styles, probably about 35 to 40 could be described. There's probably only about 20 or so that are commonly used, even less than that, perhaps. Um, so let's have a look through some of the styles. This is the Midland style uh, throughout the Midlands and uh, uh, usually Hawthorne, but not necessarily. It's unique and it has two sides, the clean side here facing us and the brash which goes out to the back, which is the field the stock would be in following this uh, hedge lane. 
this near side uh, in this year, we would, if we were in a field rotation system, would be a crop. So the animals cannot get to the new growth, which grows up from this clean side. It's also called a bullock fence, big, strong fence. Now, all the styles that uh, you see, it's the same principle of cutting on whatever style there is. This is where we, we cut down on uh, the opposite side that we want the hedge to lay into. We cut right down at an angle. So we're thinning down, thinning down until quite a surprising amount is, is left, quite a low amount is left. And that is allowed, acts as a hinge and allows us to take the, each stem or pleature over. We then cut off the heel, which is the bottom of the stem there, that usually would be a sort of noggin sticking up. We cut off the heel, so the regrowth comes from that point there. And here again, you can see quite how finely we cut down and the heels all cut off neatly and you get regrowth from there. And all that, of course, is living entity. It's a living hedge providing wonderful instant habitat, which you wouldn't get if you were coppicing, perhaps. I'm sure I'm Everybody knows hedge laying that's listening in probably, but you know, we go along sequentially. We usually start at the uphill end of a hedge and we move down, taking one stem at a time, laying it over to whatever finished style that we've chosen. Once again, that's the Midland really clearly showing the tall brush at the back of it and the clean side. This is a Lancashire and Westmoreland style, double brush uh, style from sort of sheep country. And your, your Devon style on these magnificent big wide banks with a comb, as we call it, along each edge, both front and back here, held in with the crooks. South of England, uh, it's very much a double brush style, which means it has branches both sides of the state line. And this is something I sort of developed myself. I call it conservation hedge laying. It's not the cheapest thing in the world to do hedge laying. And particularly if you're laying between two fences, you perhaps don't need the staking or the binding. So to save a bit of money, so it's cheaper for the land owner, uh, we don't use the stakes and binders, and it's better for me, the hedge layer, because I can get more done per day, so everybody's happy. But it still leaves, as you see, quite a neat job, very instant wildlife habitat. Now, once you've laid a hedge, um, that's when the management starts. You don't just want to let that grow straight back up again. You could do, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think after investing all that time and money, you would want to manage that. You'd want to keep that as thick and dense for as long as possible before you then start to incrementally allow it to go forth until the next time it's laid. But we need to sort of buy time. So I would strongly suggest that you trim your laid hedges, certainly for the first five years or so, to keep them nice and thick, which encourages them to grow even more densely. I often go along on small sections uh, with, my, uh, with the long-handled hedge pruner here, and I've lent it like that just to show you that nice a shape that you can start to train the hedge to for want of a better word you know this, this a shape really is very beneficial for a deep uh, thick base of a hedge you can see signs of hedge laying absolutely everywhere when you go around uh, the countryside really old hedge laying this is a really sort of interesting combination of people laying in different directions um, you see things like this this old hawthorn pleacher with the vertical growth growing off the preacher and those in turn can be laid next time as well so you can as you drive around in the winter you can see these wonderful old preachers uh still there now hedge length's not for everybody it can be expensive and as rob said you know if you wanted a source of wood fuel then you can coppice the hedge down to ground level it's a bit of a shock to the ecosystem there's nothing there for a few years but certainly for a, for a percentage of your hedges on a on a farm not all of them you can certainly coppice on rotation and uh, you can do it by hand as the previous slide or you can use these tree shears these uh, amazing beasts that go on, on onto a mini digger or, 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 or a 360 digger and they they grab each stem and lift it clear of the hedge very fast and efficient although i do like to cut uh get the machine uh, operated to cut them about two or three feet higher then i go along with the chainsaw to make a, a neater cut because they can crunch up the stems a bit so Coppicing um, works very well um, as long as your hedge is not too old and, and senile. Uh, this is one I did a couple of years ago, and this was about two months after we coppiced. We planted up the gaps, which is the other thing about coppicing. It gives you the opportunity to plant up the gaps. But already you can see the new growth spring, um, springing up from that stump uh, already. And this I just took yesterday at the same hedge. That's two years growth on the stems at the back and all the new plants are all, all, all growing in there. So we've really thickened that hedge up by coppicing and replanting up the gaps. And that's another hedge, but that was two years, two years after we coppiced and planted up the gaps. 
So this sort of summarizes this life cycle thing. If you start in the top right hand corner, we've got a healthy hedge with lots of stems. But if we keep thrashing that at the same height for the next 30, 40, 50 years, it will go downhill in the life cycle to this thing up in the top left hand corner where everything is pretty well given up. Alternatively, bottom left, you see a healthy hedge there, plenty of stems. But if we neglected that, then it would literally descend or advance into this nearly collapsing hedge uh, through neglect. And so I came up with this idea of a hedgerow management cycle and a score of one to 10 that you can give to a hedge when you look at it, particularly in the winter. And uh, I won't read all that, but the, the, each stage of the life cycle is given in this number from one to 10. The red at either end, over trimming, are danger as it were. The three there, amber, for, you know, watch where you're going with that one. Green in the middle, healthy hedge. And then as you start to stop management, you move into another amber and then red at the bottom there, nine and 10, where it's developing into a line of trees. So to me, the ideal sort of hedgerow vision is to keep a hedge between sort of three and then sort of eight. And you manage the hedge, you delay the speed that the hedge uh, wants to advance, but you don't altogether stop it. So you're buying time, 30, 40, 50 years, but recognizing that you will eventually have to rejuvenate it. And with incremental trimming, you can do that. But with incremental trimming, you must, of course, realize that the hedge will get big. But at the end of that time, you'll have lots of healthy stems still there rather than half the hedges died out, as it were. And I'm just quickly going to run through uh, just some typical ones. So that's a number one. It has been heavily smashed for years. It's being invaded by elder, sycamore, whatever. And there's only one thing to do. You've got a coppice that plant up the gaps or possibly even grub it out. It's the worst possible nightmare. Number three, there's that hedge again, which, yes, it's got lots of stems, but let's not keep smashing it at the same height because it will descend to number two or one. Number five, in the middle, healthy hedge, not being cut every year, perhaps two meters high, lots of stems, lots of wildlife. And then as it, you, you stop the management, you'll see the hedges start to develop. Number seven, it's a taller hedge, still healthy, lots of stems, descending again through neglect to this score of nine and then 10, the line of trees. And if you can imagine the hedge moving through that and being in control of that development, then I think we're going a long way to looking after our hedges better. I want to talk quickly about planting, if I may, not on the detail of how to, but just sort of a plea really. So there's, there is a call to plant 220,000 kilometers of hedge in the next, uh, up to 2050, I think, which is great. We're all absolutely fantastic. But let's think what we do with them after we've planted them. This hedge, uh, I happen to know, is 22 years old. It's on poor soil, hasn't grown that much. But it, it, what is it providing? It's been trimmed at that height ever since it was planted pretty well. You can see there's nothing in the bottom. It's providing no habitat. So what, 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 what are we trying to do with new hedges like that? You know, there are two options, really. One is if you were brave and you didn't have many rabbits or deer, you could cut them all off and then you'd get multiple shoots from each stem. Or... You could say, right, I'm going to incrementally increase the height now and let it up to be laid. Because really, if all our hedges that we plant are going to be like that, you have to question why, <laughs> apart from perhaps some carbon storage going on. This is another hedge, which is about this magic age of about 20, 25 years old kind of thing. This is, again, not a quick growing site, but it is now ready to be rejuvenated. It's grown away and um, now is the time to step in and thicken that hedge up. And there's that hedge being trimmed. That's my son there just um, finishing laying that in South of England style. Now, this is a really interesting hedge. This chap, when he planted his hedge, he literally cut it off when it was about two foot tall. He cut it, not cut it off to ground level. I mean, he started to trim it at about two foot, three foot tall. And you think, wow, what's he doing? He did that for about five or six years. And then slowly from, from, from small started to then thicken it up. Uh, allow it to come up incrementally. And now this hedge is about 22 years old as well. So you can see the difference. Subtle management with that hedge has brought that forward to be a really thick hedge. Um, and that's the sort of thing we should be doing with our newly planted hedges. Hedgerow trees, Rob's alluded to, very, very, very important in our landscape. How do we get those into our hedges? Well, very often we plant them when we're planting a hedge, but this is often what happens. They get cut off 
with the hedge trimmer you know you can see this is not a rabbit spiral this is a tree guard around this thing it's been smashed off everybody's forgotten about it you know it's never going to make a tree you can see how it's got that crack going straight down the middle so that's not a particularly good idea unless we're really going to mark where they are so this is again i go back to this 20 25 year uh time scale this hedge um 25 years old we just finished laying this about two months ago in gloucestershire and those trees were in that they were those oak trees were planted in that hedge have grown up it's almost as if the hedge was a nursery crop took the oaks up and we revealed those and there they are they're strong and healthy and ready to go so you've got to make a decision you know are you just just list, let the hedge go on up or you've really got to mark those hedgerow trees uh, otherwise they get chopped off another good idea is gaps in hedgerows we're often very keen to plant up gaps with new hedge plants well actually a gap in a hedge is a perfect place for a tree because the hedge trimmer is going to see it uh, we know trees cast a bit of shade anyway so let's put all our trees in, in in gaps they're just crying out for it and one other way of introducing trees perhaps not trees as in giant oaks or whatever you know big standards this person this farmer has just allowed occasional hazel tree to just pop up he's just lifted his machine off gone around it and let them develop and they really break up the landscape you know they provide perfect song posts for things like yellow hammers etc so that's an instant way of getting trees they're not huge as i say elm trees or oak trees but you know uh, uh, it's said that a mature hawthorn tree can provide as many berries each year as 300 meters of trimmed hedge I, i'm sure even more so really um so that's another way of just just letting an occasional bush go up that, i say those are hazel Coming to the end of my talk now, and um, I do a lot of farm surveys all over the country, and this was a very, I have to say, bleak estate, really, in Dorset. But occasionally when you're walking around, losing the will to live, looking at the hedges, occasionally you'll come across what I call a hot spot. You suddenly think, wow, there we are. Look, listen, and you can hear the insect life. You can see birds in and out as you walk along it. You can see them flittering forward, moving ahead of you. And this hedge was, was one of those on, on a pretty dull farm really it's lots of brambles tumbling out of there it's tall it's not being trimmed every year it's got a bit of a margin there and this is you know this is what wildlife wants that's where birds want to nest and and it, not every hedge on the farm is going to look like this because hedges will be going through different parts of their life cycle but these hot spots as i call them this was in norfolk i did a management plan here not so long ago this combination of a margin and a, and a sort of woolly wild hedge that's going through this phase of its life where it's just being let go trees sunny side here absolutely alive with wildlife so was this little short section of hedge it, i wish i could have recorded the insect sound you know so you know we don't want to see that smash back and ruined you know yes it light trimming every now and again and then it will need rejuvenating but um think about producing abundance on your farm through letting nature kind of do its thing through a controlled way with light incremental trimming and that's my last slide um just a general landscape slide to to say that you know we really must uh look after our hedges in this country and that does involve rejuvenation recognizing the life cycle of a hedge and just being gentle with them and not smashing them to death thank you very much for listening Thanks very much, Nigel. That was um, that was really good. Um, I you mentioned Hedgelink, and I did mention at the beginning that obviously Rob and yourself are both very involved with that. Um, we'll put a link to that um, in the chat. I just had a quick question about your hedgerow cycle. So maybe if I can grab you back up on screen again. Um, that was really interesting. And is that information available either on your website or on the Hedgelink website? Where are you? Oh, he's gone. I think he's accidentally popped himself out. So we'll have to do questions later. Um, so obviously, Nigel's got an immense amount of experience through his whole, whole life. And he um, does a lot of management and gives advice all around the countryside. So I will put the link to his website um, in the chat as well. Um, so hopefully, um, if you want to get in touch with him, you can. And there's quite a bit of information in there as well. So our last speaker um, of this evening is Mike Ingram. Um, so this is just going to be a, um, a short um, chat, really. 
um, about a group that he's been involved with for a while. So he's also been involved with hedgerow management for many years. So we had three kind of veteran hedge <laughs> hedge people on, on tonight. Um, but he's here tonight to talk about a community wood group um, that he's been part of for the last few years. And they're a small group of individuals under the umbrella charity of Sustainable South Brent. And I'll let Mike tell you a bit more about that. And it's really a group that works to encourage people to learn new skills and help in the sustainable management of hedgerows and woodlands in the parish. So I'll hand over to Mike to tell us a bit more. Thanks, Tracy, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and it's great to hear Nigel's uh, and uh, Rob's talk as well. And in really my talk is sort of like the ending of rob's one and where he talked about community um, work which is really important and as tracy said um i'm part of representing tonight the south brent wood woodland and hedges group um and that is uh, really a, a component of sustainable south brent which is where i live and for those of you who don't know south brent is a village just on the southern edge of dartmoor um, and just to put in context, um, Sustainable South Brent um, is, a, is a charity that was set up in 2006 to start projects, actions and initiatives to encourage public participation in long term sustainability um, of the parish. At the moment, I think we, we have about 274 uh, fully paid members of SSB and one of the components is this uh, South Brent uh, Woodland and Hedges group, but we also have um, other groups as well um, to do with composting, litter picking, cycle hire um, and other initiatives as well. So with the wood group, um, basically uh, we, um, uh, slide there, we just first slide there. Um, we have sort of two areas of work, really. The first is um, sort of a, a winter activities which uh, involve um, woodland management. Uh, and we mostly work in a, um, a, a woodland trust site uh, just on the edge of the village and, and help with the management of that wood, largely through coppice management um, and um, thinning the woods. Uh, and the second activity to do is the hedge management. Um, and we sort of divide the, the winter into two halves, really. We have the sort of first half potentially as doing the sort of coppicing and then the hedge laying comes in perhaps on the second half of the winter. And we go through, we, we, we meet as a group um, from October right the way through till March. And we meet every other weekend on Sunday um, and uh, we undertake these activities. And the hedge laying, hedge steeping one, um, is is a key one um at the moment we have um about 12 regular members of the the hedge group um and the and woodland group and we have over this year we have other people who come and go with that and we've had about 30 people this winter who have sort of participated in with it um and it's really a, a sort of great activity to get involved with, with the community. It's a way in which, as part of the SSB sort of ethos, really, is to get people out into the countryside um, within their local parish and to help manage uh, a, an area of local uh, of habitat. And um, it's, it's a really key thing, particularly during the last couple of years with COVID as an outdoor activity, we've been able to, to, to carry on as much as we can. Um, and I think it's been a real help for a lot of people being able to get out and meet as a group. Um, so basically, we, we have a sort of a core group of us who are reasonably experienced at doing hedgerow uh, management, hedge laying, or steeping as it's called in Devon. Um, and um, we're able to um, help and instruct people who are new to the skill to come out and have a go at doing it. And you can see a slide here of uh, a hedge that we steeped and cut this winter um, in the parish. Uh, and there's a, a group actively doing that on the roadside, actually right against the Woodland Trust site we, uh, we work in as well when we're doing coppicing. 
So it's it's a really uh, key activity. It's a it's a great friendly sort of group. Um, we it's you know we have a, a, a get together as I say on the Sundays, um, and um, people are able to have a go at doing hedge laying. They learn about particularly not just the skill of of how to lay a hedge, but actually learning how to use hand tools as well, uh, which is really crucial for doing a good job. A lot of people won't have been uh, familiar or have used many of the hand tools like bill hooks and axes and things um, before. Um, and so it's uh, the sort of two skills really is learning how to use the hand tools and actually um, uh, learning how to un and understanding what how to manage a hedge. Um, so just the next slide here. And one of the other aspects of the work we have as well is we try and utilize as much as possible the, the products from the hedge. Um, here there's some bean rods and some pea sticks that will probably end up down in the uh, parish allotments. Um, and on top of that, we also um, utilize and particularly some of the older pieces of uh, material that come out of the, out of the hedges, um, that'll be used for firewood. Um, and we have a, a sort of a processing uh, area um, within the village, um, locally known as the marsh, where any of the firewood that's potentially usable gets taken down to this processing area. And the, um, it's then cut up. Um, the larger bits are cut up and split into firewood. And... Um, the smaller bits are uh, processed with a machine called a chunker, which basically produces into small, very small diameter, uh, literally chunks of wood, and they're all bagged up. And then these are sold to the local uh, community, and the money from that goes back into the, the wood group funds. Um, and um, um, and as I say, the, and any of the members who have um, helped with the with the work um, in doing that and helping with the coppicing or hedge laying, um, you know, we're entitled to a few free bags of firewood and uh, and chunks as well. So it's a really good way of use, utilizing a local resource as much as possible and touches a little bit on, on Rob, Rob's talk as well with wood fuel. Um, and um, as I say, it's also, you know stuff going through allotment as well is a, a way in which we can try and sort of wean people off buying sort of bamboo sticks from china and things like that so um hopefully all of it will sort of add to the sort of more sustainable element of the work we also get together in the outside of the sort of the main season if you like for cutting and that and we do um get together and we'll have sort of tool sharpening sessions um perhaps in the summer or um and uh, we'll get together and and go through that. And there's a sort of training element there as well of how to maintain the tools and keep them safe. We have a number of um, tools which we we keep for uh, people to come out and have a go. Um, and um, they're all sort of you know maintained and um, you know by the group. Um, and um, we don't use any machinery at all in it, so it's all just hand tools. So we keep away from any of the sort of health and safety issues with with using machinery. Um, and I think that's my really all I've got to say. Really, um, it's a sort of small group, as I say, that um, are really actively involved with a really proactive way of managing their local environment. And um, it's a really great group to belong to, really, and very, um, uh, you know, proud to be part of it. And it's a very friendly, welcoming group. We're very inclusive um, in terms of the people who can come out, um, and um, and hopefully people get a lot out of it. So I think on that, I'll hand back to you, Tracy. <laughs> Came in twice there. Thanks, Thanks very much, Mike. That was really interesting. I have um, put the contact details for the. Um, Wood Group and also the Sustainable South Brent web um, address as well in the chat so people can have a, have a look at those. Um, I did like your comment about not having to worry about health and safety just before your last slide as well. Those, I know they will be razor sharp if they're your axis. <laughs> but uh, 
Great. Um, that's really interesting and really inspiring to see actually what um, we can do at that sort of small community group kind of level as well. I was quite interested um, and maybe someone may have asked actually about how you kind of negotiate with the landowners and how that side of things works. But um, we'll um, field some of the questions now because I've seen there's been lots and lots of comments coming through. Um, so lots of questions about all sorts of things. So I'm just going to um, cherry pick some um, some things. Actually, there was a few questions about um, the new elms um, that's coming in, the environmental land management, so replacing the kind of older um, pre-Brexit agricultural schemes. And how hopeful are you that hedgerow is going to encourage better hedgerow management? We've obviously got these targets of increasing the amount of hedges is the advice there for people to be able to kind of do the kind of thing that Nigel has outlined so that they're going to know what they're what they're doing I don't know who would like to maybe you'd like to pick that one up Nigel or Rob okay shall I come in there um, yes it's too early to say yet um, that the main main scheme will be the sustainable farming incentive and that's had some options for hedgerows there. They had a, what they call a standard, um, but they were not very exciting. They were leased, and some of them are very unambitious, like encouraging one tree, hedgerow tree, for 400 metres. So that was very much in the pilot. In the one that's actually the main agreement, uh, which has been rolled out this year, there are no hedgerows. It's all focusing on soils. The hedgerows are going to come later. And so I'm hoping they'll have a rethink because what's really important and what would be novel and exciting is that they start to think about hedgerows in three ways. Not, first of all, not just as rows of trees and shrubs, but thinking about the hedgerow holistically in terms of all its different structural components. Secondly, about, and this very much bears for what Nigel was saying, you know, you don't want to just think of a hedge as being an individual unit. You've got to think about how it fits into the landscape. So you don't want all your hedges in the landscape to be the same. You've got to have this variety across the landscape. And the third thing is very much around the life cycle management. So it's got to encourage life cycle management. So in the schemes like countryside stewardship at the moment, capital payments are made available for hedge laying. So you kind of separate hedge laying off as something completely different from normal hedge management. And really the thinking should be, as Nigel's experienced so well, it should all be part of a cycle. So I'm very hopeful that those things will be addressed in the SFI when it finally comes out. The other big scheme, which will be the successor to a countryside stewardship, is the local nature recovery scheme. But really, that's not going to start to appear to the end of next year and we know precious little about that, other than that it's supposed to be encouraging collaboration between farmers. And if it does, then I think we can really get things moving. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, has Mike or Nigel got anything to add? Uh, yeah, to agree with Rob, I, I suppose we don't really know. But Rob, am I right in saying, Rob, that we think that incremental trimming will actually be featured in some way? Have we heard this, haven't we? Well, it, we in the pilot scheme it was it was featured in a sort of right. uh, but we don't know what will happen in the main scheme you know when it's eventually rolled out right um hopefully it will be yeah and and the life cycle thing i think is crucial and the, and that rejuvenation you know assistance with that i think is crucial because if you rejuvenated all your hedges on cycle around the farm you're going to have all sorts of stages and you're getting all those services that you require you know yeah, actually, the, the hedgerow cycle that you talked about, I did ask you when you accidentally... Um, I do apologise, <laughs> I pressed the wrong button and disappeared. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Um, is that <laughs> something, I mean, that was interesting, and I've seen that before. Is that on the Hedgelink website? Yes, it is. Yes, yes. great. Yes. Okay, that's cool. 
Um, yeah, so lots of thoughts there. It's about that diversity of stages and, and um, types of hedge, I guess, at all the different um, stages in that management cycle. Um, I was going to just pick up on something you said about elder, and I've heard that before, and I didn't know whether people were very familiar when you were saying that, you know, you get elder invading and it kills off other species. That's not something I'd heard of, I must admit, until fairly recently. So is that... Well, I'd perhaps I probably qualify that in a sense before people leap at me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah well, there is an important plant for, um, you know, Rob will know that, you know, it for, for lichens and all sorts of things on it. But to me, when 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 elder becomes dominant in a hedge, then to me, something is slightly going wrong with the management. And you see this on lowland hedges all the time. There's hedges near me, where which in my lifetime have turned from a hawthorn hedge into an elder hedge completely, you know. Um, in a in a healthy hedge, which is growing vigorously and nothing is dominating or anything, elder can be in there and it's not really causing a problem. I think I'm right in saying, and Rob may know the scientific word for it, but it does draw stuff up from the ground, doesn't it, Rob? And tend to kill off things around about it. There's a name for that, isn't there? Yeah, I think it was allopathic, um, but it is actually it is actually you're right. It is toxic. And so its roots actually secrete substances which kill off other trees and shrubs, which right. is why, you know, you do get these gaps developing where you get elder in hedges. Yeah. And I think, but I think, you know, if a hedge is healthy, then it, it's, it's welcome there because it's not going to be out of balance. It's when the hedge is stressed, mm. elder gets in and it just goes, whoopee, I can, I'm going to take over. That's the point I'm making. Yeah. Okay. That's that's great. <laughs> you clarified that nicely for me. Um, so you were kind of saying about your um, conservation style of hedge laying, Nigel, and you've basically got those kind of fenced areas. And someone was talking about if, um, I think they're probably talking about Devons, they're talking about hedge banks. If they move their stock away from the hedge banks, um, is there an optimal width of buffer strip between the field and the hedge? I think I'll pass this over to Rob because he, he does farm in Devon. And, you know, it, it's a, it's, there are two sides to this and it causes quite a lot of arguments. In lowland England, um, we seem to always uh, erect a, head, a fence when, you know, next to a hedge. Um, and so be it. You know, that's perhaps our stocking levels are too high these days for, for laid hedges to be totally stock proof. Um, but the conservation style was developed because I thought to myself, well, we don't need to be using expensive stakes and binders if we're between two hedges. That was the point in that. And if we can get more hedges laid for our for our dollar, as it were, then all good and good and well. But Rob, I think probably will have strong opinions on where to put a, a fence, won't you, Rob? Well, they're not strong opinions. The first opinion I have is that if one can avoid having a fence, so much the better. Yeah, I mean, you've these got a days, back, for example, yeah. That's right. Now, it's almost a condition of grant aid now, particularly yeah. in livestock areas, that if you lay a hedge, you put up a fence. And that immediately makes the hedge redundant from the point of view of a stop-proof barrier. But it also makes management so much more difficult because you really want, if you're going to get good herb rich margins, you want the animals to be able to graze up to the base of the hedge, not intensively, but likely, you've got a rock and great fence, and really you can't do that. But if you do have to have a fence, then our thinking now is generally that you have the fence fairly tight to the bank, um, because at least then the stock can graze through the fence, through the stock netting to some extent. And there's also a real risk that if your fence is somewhere away from the bank, the deer attempting to jump from the bank out into the field get trapped in the top wires of the fence and they can suffer a horrible death that way. Okay, I'll move on from that one then. <laughs> yes, and I think there was another question that was quite similar and I think um, I have often wondered this actually, particularly with the Devon hedge way of uh, laying where it's flat on along the top of the bank. Um, that um kind of the midland style looked fairly stock proof but is there a kind of way that you can manage livestock and other things so that a freshly laid hedge which is not going to be maybe quite so stock proof or or would you just always have a fence there anyway what's thinking back beyond sorry back 
before we had fences so we would have been laying hedges and yes. would they have been very stock proof when they're first yeah, done yeah. Yes, they would have been. And, you know, different areas had the different styles. That's why they evolved. Um, I, I do genuinely think stocking rates were a lot uh, less. And so there wasn't perhaps the, the pressure on them. Some browsing of hedges is actually quite beneficial. You know, I go back to this idea of, you know, herbivores browsing the hedge. But, it, you know, sheep would typically, if there was hundreds of them, get right underneath quite quickly and take away that cover in the base kind of thing. Um, so we would use when we, if we knew livestock were both sides, then you'd use what we call a double brush hedge and you'd make it as thick and dense as possible. And and yes, uh, it perfectly well could be stock proof. A, a lot are actually, you know, especially down in Devon. Um, it, it's certainly certainly very possible. But with modern sort of speed on roads and things, you, you're going to, you know, you don't want the chance perhaps these days. of That's not negating the fact that hedges should be stock proof. Don't get me wrong. But it's traditionally... <laughs> Sorry, go on. No, please, Mike. No, no, I say I wish there was a great slide that I think you had Rob of a Devon hedge, and the way in which it's it's steeped is that you've got the the the, the growth the, the steeped pleachers on either side of the bank, and the original idea was that would actually prevent help prevent sheep getting up onto the bank, uh, and um, you know to to you know to help the bank and also the bank you know, would have been, you know, repaired at the same time, perhaps as when they were, you know, laying the hedge. So, um, and that was always the way I was taught with a, a farmer who, you know, did that kind of style, is that that, um, you know, you had to lay the pleachers on the edge of the bank. Yeah. And you could walk down the middle of the bank. In fact, in hedge laying competitions in Devon, you know, you, you know, the judge would actually be able, should be able to walk down the middle of the bank. Mm. Yeah, that makes yeah, sense, yeah. actually, looking at that picture that Rob had up. Yes, Rob? Yeah. Just one other thing. Of course, there is the option of temporary electric fencing. So after your hedge has just been laid or when you've planted a new hedge, rather than go to the expense um, of putting up, you know, a permanent stop fence, then just electric fence it for a few years. And then if your stocking is not too dense, you should be able to just remove it and job done. Cool another another simple solution um i've got a question directly for mike actually from smoky dragon um what's your view as to whether such groups would be happy to support farmers rather than charities i'm not quite sure where they're going with that but i think they would like to encourage community involvement on their farm um well just to, we we do work for um different sort of landowners private landowners who have got a hedge we try and do it in a, a you know hedge laying in a more public area so people can sort of see us and we can talk to um members of the public about what we're doing um you know we do do stuff on on some farms i have to say not that many at the moment and if we are asked to do it you know we would look at look at that um and um you know if it was a suitable hedge to lay um that we could easily do within the winter or so then you know we would we would definitely look at that um and it's a way you know from within the parish of engaging with farmers and other landowners who've got hedges so i'm not sure whether that answers the question or not but um um like possibly you know, we are small <laughs> we offer ask for a donation for uh, you know the work we we do i mean i have to say that probably your a bit of a unique community group in that you are a, a, a group of people with some degree of expertise in what you do um and that's maybe not always the case everywhere um nigel no, yeah, sorry. yeah if, if, if i might offer another uh, way into community involvement with hedges here in my local town in oxfordshire uh about a year ago we started um a hedge survey project product project in the parish um, we had about sort of 15 people, I suppose, sign up to that. We gave them basic ID training and we used the People's Trust for Endangered Species survey format. And over many, many weekends, it did go on a bit. We've got a lot of hedges. You certainly will in most parishes in Devon. But it was great. Uh, they really felt they had some, uh, you know, involvement in their community local farmers were friendly you might not always get that but there were most of them nearly all of them there was one that said oh, no thank you very much that's fine we're totally his prerogative but most people let us go onto their land we could do a lot from footpaths as well and that led 
to us uh, identifying um, some hedges which needed work. Again, the landowners were great. We copied some hedges. We had a group of twice, a group of 40 people out um, planting hedge, hedges there. And we've made a film on it. The film went viral sort of thing. Other parishes in the country love the thing and they want to do it. We get lots of questions. That's a really good way of getting people involved in a local hedgerows. That sounds great, actually. We've got a local group here. Where I think some members would be really keen to get their teeth into something like that. Rob? Yeah, Tracy, um, Nigel's mentioned it, but it is that the, the thing that People's Trust for Endangered Species have, have done is they've developed this hedgerow survey. It's called it the Great British Hedgerow Survey, and they produced apps and all sorts of things. And Megan Gimber has led on that. She may be listening into us today. I don't know, but done that's a splendid job. And it's a, it's a really good, easy survey, hedgerow survey technique that gives a lot of really useful information. So do look at the PTES website to find out details about that. Great. I've just put the link actually in the chat. So that takes people yeah. to that section of the website. And I think um, there's lots of information about their surveys and apps and things. So, yes, do get involved like that. Um, I'm aware we're kind of up at nine o'clock, but we've got quite a lot of questions left. So if people are happy to have a couple more, if you're all right for time. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's quite a lot of questions about training. Um, there's a lot of people on here that are doing various things, but are looking um, at where they can get training. And there's been some comments about the Rural Skills Trust. Um, I don't know if you've got any other, I guess it depends where people are, um, but maybe Hedge Link, would that be a place that people can look if they're a, a directory of? Yeah, I'd also recommend people look at the National Hedge Laying Society's um, okay. website. They have lists of courses being run around the country. We've just uh, introduced a new improved uh, accreditation scheme that people can both go on the courses and then try out to get a, a, a bronze and then a silver and go on to be a master mm -hmm. craftsman if they wished but there's there is lots of courses around around the country which are you know easily found and um, thoroughly recommend them and they're usually through the hedgeling society they'll be run usually by accredited trainers as well ah okay that's useful because that's something you've been doing for a long time isn't it nigel yeah yeah um I did have, and there's, there's been a few questions about different species and things, and you talk quite a lot about hawthorn hedges as sort of pure kind of one species type. If if someone is planting a hedge, um, I'm kind of probably coming back to Devon, but I, you know, I guess this could apply elsewhere. Have you got a sort of optimal mix that's going to be, give you a decent hedge, but also going to give you that nice variety for wildlife are there key things that you would include anyone well oh, just I'm, I'm sure rob's rob's going to answer this in greater detail but i would say it's really important to look around you and look at your soil types look what's growing in the area and you know those hawthorn hedges were planted at the time of the enclosures and these days we would plant a mixed species hedge most certainly um but i'm sure Devin, i'm sure rob's got a sort of devon uh, species list um yes uh, thank you, Nigel. We're, if you, uh, the Devon Hedge Group is just about to publish guidance about how to make a new Devon Hedge. I say make a new Devon Hedge because it's about making the bank as well as planting it up with trees and shrubs. So, I mean, I just received the final um, web ready version today. So that will go on the Devon Hedge Group website shortly. And it does include some suggested species mixes for different soil types. Uh, the point I, I think the point I'd stress here is how important it is that, that species you should plant a variety of different native species. Um, and that there isn't certainly in Devon much of a case to be made anywhere for planting single species hedges anymore. No, no. Um, part because they're not very good for wildlife, but actually mainly because they're not resilient in the face of climate changes and diseases and pests. So even where, for example, like on parts of the Black Downs or Exmoor, we have a lot of single species beech hedges, there's now a consensus kind of emerging that even there you wouldn't plant single species beech hedges anymore. That our focus these days 
should be forward looking, planting hedges for the present or as far as we anticipate the future, not, not respecting past cultural or historical values in an area. In practice, though, you can often do both. So you can be forward looking and still respect the heritage of an area. But no more single species hedges except in exceptional circumstances. Yeah, totally good. And yes, and of course, we're losing a lot of our ash in hedges at the moment. So there will be potential for popping in other things into those gaps. And I think also um, people talk about trying to future proof by planting things from other hotter climates, but actually uh, the local adaptation of the species in your area um, and a good mix of those is going to give you the best kind of um, resilience, as you say, Rob, and kind of yeah. genetics diversity that is going to give that sort of optimum chance. I just thought I'd stick that one up. This is <laughs> so this is another oh, yeah. publication. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I recently uh, purchased. Um, so you, there was a number of um, publications through the, um, the Devon Hedge Group. Um, really useful. I think this is a bit more of a sort of introductory overview, isn't it? But actually, I found it really interesting. So um, yes, do look out for those. Um, I kind of think we've probably got to um, a good point there. There's just so much that we could probably chat on all night, to be honest. Um, so <laughs> I'd just like to sort of finish up really by um, thanking you all very much for coming along and sharing your quite huge expertise with us. And um, we just got a bit of a, a snippet, I think, into that, that knowledge that you all have. Um, and also to thank all our viewers. Um, and hopefully we may be back over next winter with some more webinars. But in the meantime, do have a look at the More Meadows website and, as I say, the um, the forum as well. So um, I shall say uh, good night and um, hope to see you all at an, on an online talk sometime next season. <laughs>